Romans 8, 14 through 17 is our text. It is the epistle lesson for Pentecost. And so we're looking at Pentecost, the action of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we confuse that word Pentecost and think it means spirit. It means 50 days. Okay, I've forgotten that. Pente. Thank you. Yeah, that uh, 50 days. It refers to 50 days after Passover. And it's a Jewish feast originally called Shaviot, the feast of Thanksgiving. And it was that first ripe ear of wheat. Uh, bringing their first fruits. Yeah, bring it, and it's, it, it, if you were to call it in English, you would call it first fruits. Mm -hmm. And um, it's still celebrated. And, and so, as God does so oftentimes, God will take something that's been raised in the past and reinterpret it for us today. And so we can actually see where he's given types of Pentecost in the past. And uh, anytime God pours out in abundance, and we give God thanks for that pouring out in abundance, it's a Pentecost event. And of course, in the Pentecost we think of, it's the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It's like, uh, you know, everybody's bringing in their first fruits, and God says, y'all ain't seen nothing yet. And then he gives his first fruits as a way of saying, this is just the beginning. And 3,000 are saved in one day, Acts 2. So we look at a different passage that has to do with the Spirit. And I want to start with a question, who is a Christian? What, what denotes being a Christian, a real Christian, a, a, a for sure Christian? And there are very different answers out there. Some say, well, Christian is when you act like a Christian. And, and so you have orthopraxy, the right practice or correct practice. Uh, preacher was talking to old farmer and the old farmer said, well, well, what is a Christian? And the preacher said, well, uh, you know, this is in the old days of holiness. A Christian is one who doesn't drink, dance, or chew. And the farmer said, well, my mule is a Christian. <laughs> In times of violence, too many times in America, uh, violent people would refer to their enemy when they killed them as, I'll make them a good Christian and lay down, as a way of saying they're not going to cause me trouble anymore. So is it when you act? Uh, some people say when you have certain beliefs, we, we have the Apostles' Creed that we look to, I believe in, and a Christian is one who can go down the list and check off the marks and say, I have the right belief, which is orthodoxy, right belief, and that's a claim that I always use. When people say, well, you're conservative or you're traditional, I like to, to correct that to, I'm orthodox because I have my focus on right belief. Some people will say you're Christian when you worship in, in a certain way. And you think of the various communities you know and how we worship, uh, be it high church, Episcopalian, or Catholic at high mass, or at the Pentecostal church when, when, we, when we prove we're full of the Spirit by dancing. If you are Christian, you, you worship God in a specific way. Thank well, you. go ahead. I'm just, that door was, that noise was Thank distracting you. me. Thank you. <coughs> I didn't even realize why I was struggling to speak. Yeah. So we look at the idea of what is a Christian by looking at this passage, Romans 8 at 14. Therefore, brothers and sisters, uh, I'm sorry, I, I started in the wrong place. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. 
And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. Let us pray. Father, may the word of my mouth, the thought, the meditation, the heart of all here today be acceptable or in the name of Jesus become acceptable. You alone are our strength, our redeemer. Amen. So the answer here is very clear. You are a Christian if you are led by the Spirit of God. And led is a weak translation of what that is intended to say. New Jerusalem Bible says if you're guided by the Spirit. In other words, if every step you take is under the control and direction of God, the Holy Spirit. If, if being guided by the Spirit is the central focus in life. Um, Saturday we came into Memphis and, and uh, Debbie wanted to know where we were going to church. And I told her where we were going to church and then I talked to the executive pastor of that church and found out the senior pastor wasn't preaching. Nor was my friend the executive pastor preaching. They had two different lesser pastors in the congregation, lesser in the sense of uh, the positions they hold and age and experience. And so I told Debbie, I guess we're just not going to church anywhere. My friend had offered me a church, but it was a Presbyterian church, and I have trouble with the frozen chosen and that whole predestination thing. So I told Debbie, we're not going to church. And so get up early Sunday morning and wake Debbie up after a little while and say, uh, I'm, I'm going to Cogsville for the uh, 1045 service the bishop is preaching. She says, I thought you said we aren't going to church. I said, yeah, but God says I am. <laughs> Not that I was expecting, and I got pretty much what I expected. A lot of old sermon illustrations in search of a scripture. But um, to be guided means being led in ways you wouldn't have gone acting in ways you wouldn't have acted because God says different. It's, it's not blessing your own impulse. It is, in fact, looking to God and saying, God is the central control. And if God is dealing with you in any way, be it repentance, be it sanctification, <coughs> holiness, be it, be it anything, if God is dealing with you, with me, it's God the Holy Spirit because that is the presence of God, the person of God that we have here access to. Again, the, uh, the Son is seated at the right hand of the Father making intercession. So we've got this image of God, Father, and Son in, uh, in heaven. We saved a place. Thank you. I'm going to take it. <laughs> She's brave. Today. You're more brave than some. <laughs> My daughter called me and I needed to talk to her. Sure so. you did. Sure you did. We're happy to have you join us. <clears throat> Pastor, I guess to lie with you, but... 15, I realized that where I lived and the message was you didn't wear makeup, you didn't wear jewelry, you didn't smoke or drink, and then, you know, you were, you were a Christian. And until I got older and got into the scriptures, that's what I really thought because that's what I had heard. And that's what you'd been raised with. Yeah. And, and many people, this is one reason why it is so very important to raise our children, our younger people, our early converts, uh, young converts in Scripture and tell them, read it for yourself. Mm -hmm. Number one thing you can do um, 
and helping a person find right track in, in Christ is, is getting them in the Word of God and in prayer so that the Spirit, Holy Spirit can, can speak to them through Scripture. Uh, number one thing, yeah. and, and, and I thank you for that witness. Um, this includes one of Mr. Wesley's favorite passages. In the days of Mr. Wesley when this denomination formed, uh, the Church of England would teach commonly that, you know, be baptized as a baby, which is your right as an Englishman. You know, the, the church is possession of the, the country, the nation, so a citizen automatically has citizenship in the church. And, and so you be baptized, go to church when you can, do, do everything the priest tells you to do, and when you die, hope you go to heaven. And, and so uh, we would refer to that, we early Methodists would refer to that as hope so religion. Hope so. And Mr. Wesley, looking at this passage, said, no, no, never settle for hope. Settle for knowledge. Settle for what is said in, in verse 16, the Spirit bears witness. And so um, we referred to that as no-so religion, and we were the first ones that would preach that you could know that you know that you know. Not, not based on anything external, membership in a congregation, membership in a denomination, not based on um, a certain practice, but based on the fact that the Holy Spirit is inside you and gives you witness. Now, I would add to that one of the witnesses is, based on Earl's experience, one of those witnesses is correction. <laughs> and, and I found that as recently as Sunday morning when God said, no, you're going to church. You know, uh, We can know that we know. And that was one of the attractions of early Methodism was to a people who were considered outcasts. Uh, the coal miners of England, uh, London and Bristol, the outcast were taught. I mean, the church really didn't want these people. And, and so we Methodists would go out and preach, not only does God want you, we can guarantee that you know you're saved. And, and, that, and, and, and so when a, a person would convert, we would spend a lot more time praying with them at the altar and dealing with anything that was rebellious in them so that finally the Spirit would break in and give witness, you are a child of God, you are really saved. When, uh, when I was four churches ago, I had a, uh, an older gentleman, wonderful friend, he was a neighbor, and he was also a member of the church, but every week he would, Bob would come down and we would talk, and he would talk about, you know, hope I'm saved hope I'm saved. And uh, during that time, I preached a standard Methodist doctrine, very much like what y'all are hearing, standard Methodist doctrine. And at one point, three or four years after that, he had this experience of God telling him, Bob, quit asking. I answered that question a long time ago. You belong to me. Now see, the knowledge of your salvation isn't the point of salvation. It's the assurance. Mm -hmm. And, and, and you know, you, in no doubt in my mind, Bob had been saved for much longer, because otherwise he wouldn't have been worried about it. Right. But, but until he broke through this period of assurance, he lived in fear. And, and see, one of the things we're told is that God deals with that spirit of fear. The image here is the image of a parent and a child. Now, in one way, Jesus is the only child of God. The only begotten is how Romans, uh, how John 3, 16 puts it, the only begotten. I use a slightly heretical way of saying it by saying he's the only biological. And the reason it's heretical is, you know, the relationship is spiritual and biological. 
but but it's a way we can understand today that so if we are the children we're not the begotten children we're not born children maybe that's a better way of putting it than biological born child um, better exegetical way of putting it but but how are we children adoption how do we know there's something that happens at that verse 16 you know the spirit bears witness um, there's no doubt that some people will say adopted children are not as real a child as a, a biological child uh, I legally adopted Carrie in order to prevent my father from ever referring to her as my stepdaughter ever again and if you know how cheap I am it's amazing that I spent that much money on a lawyer and since she was 19 the judge in court said uh, you realize Mr. Dickerson this means absolutely nothing under the law because she was already an adult and I said well it means something to me I was crying when I said it but I was ticked <laughs> yeah um, the reason why we're hearing the, the Aramaic Abba is because the early church looked at the way Jesus talked to God the Father and thought that that Aramaic term Abba was a perfect encapsulation of that relationship of parent and child in the Garden of Gethsemane Father if it be thy will let this cup pass from me nevertheless not my will and so Abba in encapsulates the obedience and encapsulates the sacrifice of Jesus based on the will of God the Father and so here we're told we get the very same right we're not second-class children because we get to call God Abba and really Abba is not the formal father anytime Carrie called me father I knew I was in trouble <laughs> But uh, Abba is more kin to Daddy. It doesn't literally translate Daddy. It's more like Fatherling. But but it's 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 what a child would call a, a male parent in love, a Papa, you know, or Daddy, or, or something like that. Is is the is the intent? So you're being told here you get the very same expression the very same relationship now notice that expression that relationship includes understanding that as a child you obey the parent and and that you seek the will of the parent but by God's Holy Spirit making you a child the agent of your being a child of God that agent also grants you the right to look to the Father just like Jesus does and, and you can have a, a no-so. I can know that I belong to God. That includes correction and direction. It also includes empowerment. He's referred to as the spirit of truth in John's gospel that I'm preaching on this coming Sunday, the spirit of truth that will light lead you into all truth, that will guide you into all truth. And so we've got this marvelous passage here that says you're going to be just as much a child. In one way, Jesus is the only child in terms of born child. Now, we weren't first born child. We were born second born, spiritual born, or as it's commonly said, born again. But it's still born. Now, that's so follows my personal belief that in my last congregation when we started the adoption support group and invited the entire community to send us their parents and children mm -hmm. by adoption and we would import a, a Christian counselor from Nashville and, and pay all the fees and feed the adults good adult food and feed the kids good kid food and we would have uh, people with pack back, past background checks with their children and we would follow the safe sanctuary standard all for free just because we had so many kids in our community that were adopted especially at that church and again I was participating with that four or five months before I realized I qualified 
because I was the father of an adult adopted child. And they told me if I was that forgetful that she was adopted, I didn't belong. It just never occurred to me. Well, guess what? It just doesn't stick in the Father's mind. We, we cry to Him just in the same voice as does Jesus. And in fact, we're not only heirs of God, we're, we're co-heirs. That is, we're alongside of. Um, for some years, I took a more Pauline view of, of relationship and would refer to myself as the slave of Christ. And that's what, uh, you know, in, when you read in New Testament, especially in Paul's writing, when he talks about, ser it gets translated servant of Christ. It really is using a word doulos that, that means slave because of love. And uh, I use that imagery very strong in my life. Uh, Hebrew scripture says that if you've got a slave, you've got a, a Hebrew slave, you've got to set that Hebrew slave free after seven years. But if that slave wants to stay in the household, he's married there and his wife has got to stay. He's had children and the children have to stay. Then that, that slave can, can ask to be kept as a slave. And you take the slave to the doorpost of the house and you take his left earlobe and you drive an awl AWL through his ear, pierce his ear, and he will become a doulos, a slave based on love. And uh, that's an imagery Paul uses of himself, that he's chosen to be a slave of Christ. And so for years I would refer to myself as slave of Christ. If you look at my Facebook post now, you see that I'm the younger brother. You know, and I call that Pauline. Well, this is also Pauline. But, but Paul was very much focused on the idea of a slave, and that's okay, because he does serve, but, and uh, based on love. But this is also telling us my relationship, and one of the things that happens in that relationships is that we never, we have such freedom in Christ, we never again willingly become slaves. In fact, one of the, one of the ways that you can measure you're living into being Christian is by how free you are in Christ. If you're free from fear. Now, as a young child, can you ever being, can you remember ever being lost in a store or some other place, you know, separated from mama or daddy or, or grandparent? You, does anybody remember that? All right. Have you had the experience on the other hand? where you were the parent and the, the granddaughter wandered off from Opry Mills and you had to search the entire mall in fear and terror. All right, when does that end, that fear end? When you're reunited. That's what's being said here. You've been reunited with your parent. No reason to be scared anymore. And so, one of the measures of your relationship with God is how much you really believe you're reunited with God in such a way that He's the one who gives you safety and freedom from fear. However, there is an extreme to that, and we can find that over in 1 Corinthians 12, where Paul talks about limits to freedom at verse 1, he introduces the idea of a spiritual gift. Now about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, when, when you were worshiping at those false temples, when you were pagans, somehow or other you were influenced and led astray to speak to mute idols. Now pause there. The imagery is that carved stone or that carved wood is not really real, it's an idol, it's not a god, and you were led astray to, to speak to that. You know, you're praying to a log or to a stick. Therefore I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. People were looking at this idea of freedom in Christ 
And there was a heresy that arose within the body where people would say, man, I am so free, I can just say, Jesus, be cursed. I am that free in God. And Paul said, no, 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 no. The Holy Spirit doesn't ever contradict the Holy Spirit. You, you don't have contradiction there. You can't say by the Holy Spirit something that the Holy Spirit's blessing. It's by the Holy Spirit that you say, Jesus is Lord. You don't say by that Spirit, Jesus be cursed. That ain't freedom in Christ, that's freedom in Satan. Side note, how little there was a reference to Jesus at annual conference. You could occasionally hear somebody, I heard one time somebody pray in your holy name, but he didn't identify whose name was holy. And one time the bishop referred to Christ. But see, there are also progressives that talk about the cosmic Christ that would be equivalent pretty much to the force in the TV, uh, the movie Star Wars, the force be with you, like it was this, you know, power that's not personal and not a person. Uh, you don't hear references to Jesus in large groupings of liberals because Jesus is a person, Jesus is real. Now, if you do hear references, it is a good teacher or one who only proclaims love. That same Jesus that I know braided whip and drove out money changers from the temple. So, always look to the whole Bible, but it is by Jesus I have access to the Father. The agent giving power in that is the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is not going to curse that which the Holy Spirit blesses. And so, I don't care how free a person is, a person cannot be free to be non-Christian in the name of Christ. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a very key thing. 17, now if we are children, then we are heirs. An heir is somebody that inherits. Heirs of God, so anything the Father's got is coming to me. Co-heirs with Christ, I share it with my big brother and with the family, if. Now, that's the condition. When do I inherit if? We share in His, Jesus' sufferings, in order that we may also share in His, Jesus' glory. It's not saying I'm saved by works. It is saying that I'm going to be rewarded. And, and part of the Christian life includes suffering. Uh, turning the other cheek and forgiving the unforgivable and loving the unlovable and being falsely accused and lied about and not running up and grabbing the microphone and screaming. You didn't do that, did you? <laughs> no, but at one point the bishop saw me charging and he corrected the person. <laughs> I was charging down the aisle and he saw me coming. But we share in his sufferings and that we do so willingly because we know that in sharing with our sufferings we share in his glory. Now think of it, the image here is not a servant earning a wage, it's a family member participating in the family business in order to inherit the family business. Luke, Jesus at 12, staying at the temple three days after the, you know, the family's gone back and he's still at the temple and Mary rushes up. Didn't you know that your father, and she points to Joseph, mm -hmm. didn't you know that your father and I would be worried? And he said, I had to be about my father, and he points to the temple as the dwelling place of the eternal God. Did you not know I had to be? Now, some of your translations will say, in my father's house. 
other translations there will read about my father's business. Which one's correct? Correct answer is yes. Uh, the word there in the Greek is oikonia, from which we get the word economy. I had to be about my father's economy. In that day, in that place, you didn't separate business and home. Your business place was your home. You know, the living room was also the shop. And it was where you did business. And to be in the father's house is to be about the father's business. You, you know, you're a woodworker because your father was a woodworker. Or, you know, whatever you did, it was an inherited. It was part of your inheritance. And so to, to belong to the Father's house is to be about the Father's business. Now, let's translate that into Romans 8 here and look at you and I. To be in the Father's house is to be about the Father's business. If we look just as he did and, and look to the eternal God and say, Daddy, we're in the house. And so as children, sufficient to the point that we call the eternal God the same thing the Lord Jesus calls him, call him Papa, Daddy, then we also, you know, when, when Jesus does something, we just imitate what Big Brother does. It's not an earning. It's a living into my heritage. It's belonging to the family and being in the family business. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if you live by the Spirit, you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. And so the choice is ours. Live by the Spirit, which includes all that we've talked about, or not. That's your only choice. Life or death. This way is life. This way is anything else is death. Anything that's not the way, the one way, the singular way to life is in fact the way to death. That's my thought on the passage. What are, what are your thoughts? I came to an understanding <coughs> uh, through the seedbed thing as well is that you're only children of God if you believe and you have the Holy Spirit. I have I have this habit of saying to my kids when they are disparaging someone, now be careful, they're God's children too. And this has made me know that you're only a child of God if you're a believer, if you have the Holy Spirit and you're striving to live. And, and that is a key different, a difference. In the 60s, we talked about the, uh, the brotherhood of man under the fatherhood of God. Right. I'm sorry for the patriot, patriot, patristic voice there saying father, but that's the way they said it in the 60s. You know, brotherhood of man, fatherhood of God, we're going to hold hands and sing kumbaya and everything's going to be fine. Yeah. The Bible teaches that all of us are God's creation. Creation. Yeah. And, and, and the passages that talk about how we deal with one another are, are those about neighbor. When Jesus, you know, you know, when the lawyer said, well, who is my neighbor? He tells the story of the Good Samaritan which would translate today as the story of the good Iraqi Arab who is obviously Muslim. Your neighbor's that person that needs you to be a neighbor. And we are to be good neighbors. And so we can speak about, you know, and, and they were given the image of God they were created in the image. You can say they're created in the image, but that image has been corrupted by the fall. The only one that are our brothers and sisters are those that belong to Christ. As uh, E. Stanley Jones, Methodist missionary, said, everyone who belongs to Christ belongs to everyone who belongs to Christ. And, and that, you know, this is one reason why we Methodists are so big on living in community. We know we belong to one another. 
and 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 we're family. Other thoughts? I, I have some more thoughts. Good. <laughs> I've, you know, I've been disturbed about conference as well. Uh, <clears throat> But I got to thinking about this thing that <clears throat> the seedbed talks about, the awakening. And I'm thinking, look at how much the United Methodist Church is bringing attention to itself with all this division. The whole world is looking at that. God's allowing this to happen. He is. Because I think something great's going to come out of it. I agree with you, and that's what uh, Maxie Dunham proclaimed Sunday night at the, at the dinner for our group, that uh, he thinks that this is going to be revival, and it's going to lead to a global, orthodox, Wesleyan expression of Christianity. It's, it's going to be worldwide. It's not just be the United States of America. No, no, no. Methodist Church, which is what we look at it as being yeah. now, yeah. And, and it's not. And um, uh, our progressive brothers and sisters in the denomination uh, can express themselves so racist because they view the African church as being children, yeah. and they treat them yeah. as children. It's, it's a very racist, yeah. and we're saying no, those brothers and sisters. I, I just, that's my comfort in this whole thing is <clears throat> I think there's going to be a big blow up and it's all going to come out in God's favor. Amen. I really do. But on the other hand, I look at you had to suffer the last few days for no. God's purpose because if I had been there, I'd probably been out in the parking lot with the others that couldn't stand to be in there because I wouldn't know what my reaction was going to be. So I just I won't give you kudos for your your strength. Others had uh, much much worse much worse than I did, but uh, it is if there is some little part, it allows me to participate yeah. with Christ. And I just keep thinking that we've got to stand firm. Amen. That firm foundation is what we're looking for and we're standing on. Hallelujah. And just don't go running because it's uncomfortable. Exactly. You know. For too many years, we <laughs> Methodists have, have, and you know, that's how we've handled yeah. uh, problems is we've either ignored or we've run from. Yeah, exactly. And one of the things that has allowed to happen is there's enough shaking going on that the real fruit uh, is coming together and it's being known as being real fruit. Yeah. We are so connected now in this annual conference in ways that I have never experienced. Sometimes the connection is too much, this thing's going off, this phone's going off so much it feels like a vibrator attached to my belt, you know, because the brothers are talking. Mm -hmm. But we're connected. Can I ask you what happened about the merging with the... Tennessee? We took a vote and uh, the ballot was sealed until the Tennessee Annual Conference okay. gets opportunity to vote. vote. Okay. Would, uh, the bishop does not want our vote <laughs> to, to influence, to influence theirs. Sense. I agree with that. You want fairness. Exactly. <clears throat> I think I've emptied all my questions. But nobody else has any. May we pray? <coughs> Father, as always, your word is truth and life. And we live into that. And thank you for it in the name of Jesus. Amen. And thank you for Charles Wesley's hymn, Blessed Assurance. <laughs> That's all.